Okay, here we go. Hello, my sexy, ooh, fashionable, ooh, trendy, knowledgeable, comfy dance. Welcome back to another episode of Confidently Insecure. I am your host, Kelsey Dara, and this is the podcast where we are absolutely sure we don't know everything. But we can just throw that log line right out the motherfucking door this week because this is a topic I am so hyped to talk about. I know everything about. And you guys, we have an insider creator, not only for my favorite show of all time, but also doing cool shit out there in the entertainment world. You guys, I'm so excited to introduce you to Amos Mack. Amos is a television writer, artist, and founder of Original Plumbing. His personal story was featured in the HBO documentary, The Trans List. And he's been honored on the Out 100 and The Trans 100 and is the co-writer creator creator of no ordinate create writer creator writer writer of the o- no ordinary man amos mac you are a writer for the show gossip girl welcome to the podcast thank you i've never had such an introduction in all of my life and i don't think i ever will again um honestly that <laughs> I was, was there through the entire thing it was a journey it was up down yeah. all around but we got there amos i'm so excited to meet you i got connected to you through another industry mentor of mine and i've been writing and tweeting about how much i love gossip girl and talking about it on this show since like 2010 I think was the tweet that I found as long ago and you are the motherfucking like cook in the kitchen making this show I want to talk about everything you're doing but first we have to get the gossip girl conversation out of the way so tell me how okay does one get to write for our generation sex in the city I mean, well you know I no. I was a staff writer on this new season that has just come out. So that means that I am the lowest of the totem pole of writers. So still there. All, In all the room. props, all props to, you know, Josh Safran, the creator um, of the this new iteration, um, which is really not a reboot, but more of a of a um, same world new kids. Yes. Um, you know, same world that the last one existed in, just all, you know, a new 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 York, same school, yes. whatever. But I mean, my, my, my journey there was very, uh, it's all, uh, you know, the universe came together at the right moment. You know, I yes. saw like, I had been following in the trade magazines when I was reading Gossip Girl was like coming back, you know, and oh. I was very excited about that. I was putting words out to friends who, you know, like at that, at that point I was an assistant. I was like a, a script coordinator on ah, um, Transparent finale, nice. on the finale wow. of- um, Transparent, hello. Yeah, the, the musical finale. So I was doing this, it's, you know, it's a support role and mm-hmm. it's very mm-hmm. intense. And yeah. um, I'd done that for another show before Transparent. And I was, I was wow. trying to make my way up to become yeah. a, a staff writer. Wow. Uh, um, so when I saw that post, I started, you know, the, the cards align. It, that's yes. the easy way to put it, but it was yes. a journey to get there. And we totally believe in that witchy shit here on this podcast. I think like randomly the last three or four months, we've probably had four or five different witches on this show to talk about like the universe and alignment. So like, do you know your big three? Can we drop them? Get a little insight? Yeah. Let's yes. hear it. Um, I'm Sagittarius Ooh. with a uh, Libra rising Libra moon. Oh, bitch. Libra rising Libra moon. This makes so much sense that you are able to do a job like scripty coordination and like that is an intense very straightforward fast-paced job I feel like do you well feel- that one was the was the script what I think the one that's on set is the what is it that's a different job script supervisor that's the one that's, that's like right I, my there. mind but yeah but it's almost like they're like editing and you know the way that they are they're I don't even know the word. I don't know the language, but the script coordinator (laughs) is more like every time that a script change happens or like, you know, you're just coordinating Mm -hmm. with with the writers and the showrunner and then production. And it's like a juggling act. So, I mean, it's similar, but it's more, I mean. You can't hmm. fuck up in that job. Yeah, it feels like everything is lo- is is falling on onto you. In that High job. So stakes. props to everybody who has ever done that job. It is, you know, I, I honor you all, all Aww. script coordinators, past yes. and future. You're so like, I'm just noticing we're talking for five minutes, but you're so giving of like thanks and gratitude to other people. Do you ever just let that moment so- soak into yourself and be like, holy fuck, I'm a staff writer on Gossip Girl? Because I feel like you need to know you are that. 
Yes. That bitch. Right. Yes. Now. I mean, of course, it's like <laughs> it's the coolest thing. And I, you know, love to to um brag about it if when like on, yes. on Instagram, my only social platform. But like, Duh, where it matters. Um, <laughs> there is a there's a funny story, like because with the original Gossip Girl, I was living in New York City at the time and I was like to make ends meet, I was doing uh like background extra work. Yeah, of course. And of course, guess what show I ended up on Stop. in the fifth season? Stop. Um, <laughs> what? Tell me, Gossip tell me Girl. everything. Yeah. Tell me what I mean, you, what the original scene? Gossip Girl. It was like, it was a New Year's Eve party at Nate's job um, at the newspaper or whatever. Okay. Yes. And I'm in the background at this party, like oh with my, my hair slicked over in a suit. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like in the background of like, like all these like party scenes. So it's very much a full circle to be able to write on the new yes. iteration of Gossip Girl. It's okay. also like a dream. Were you a fan of the old one or was it more just like that was a job you did and you kind of knew the ecosphere of how big of a deal it was I was a fan of it but I was doing that I was doing extra work yeah basically full-time at the moment at, yeah. like it was back in the original plumbing days and it was like I was yeah. piecing together income in order to like of work course. on my passion projects and so I was doing almost full-time it was like extra work for commercials which actually paid more um yeah. and, then, and lots of television <laughs> stuff so it was oh like gosh. whatever was filming in New York City, I would usually end up on that show at least like once <laughs> or twice. <laughs> I too lived in New York City during the Gossip Girl era and listener, listeners of the show or of the Guilty Pleasures podcast, which we also did an episode about Gossip Girl. I don't know if you've heard it yet. I need to send it to you because I am like standing for life the fucking episode. Um, I was so influenced by the original show like my fashion my verbiage my like where to go when I first moved there I was like 17 or 18 when I first moved there like I had no money no fucking glad to ride the subway and it you know I had the headbands I even brought my headbands to show you that like <laughs> I, worn them all. <laughs> I wanted to be her all of them is so yeah. bad but who was your favorite character out of the original if you had to pick Oh gosh, I never had to think <laughs> of that before. Oh, because um, I feel like this version, the, the characters are so new, so fresh, so like of the times, which is like picking an old character is going to be problematic no, no matter how you spin it. Yeah. Oh, like yeah. How, let's, Serena let's, let's, Blair. No, how about the, the gay brother that lasted like a season? <laughs> Eric? <laughs> he like, what the fuck? They tried. They were like, he, he's gay. It was right? a Look different it. time. You know, yeah. it was a different time for television. It was, yeah. you know, um, but it's really cool to be able to, yes. you know, push the boundaries now and, and have representation. So, yes. So let's like slide into that conversation with the yeah. new gossip girl. Like I was so thrilled to see the freshness of diversity in casting. And one of my questions was about being like, you are a writer who is trans. And I did not know there was a trans actress playing on the show. And even in the other podcast, I said something like, oh gosh, like I'd love to see more trans representation in the show, but knowing that there is someone who plays the character and it has nothing to do with like the story and making it such a big deal. Like what, what was your involvement in that process? Are you involved in that process? Like, how, what does that mean to you for representation? I mean, it, lo it means a lot for me to be able to see a character like uh, Luna, who um, Luna -la. is an incredible, you know, Zion's an incredible actress. And, and uh, the character is, is so, is one of, is just dynamic and incredible and pointed and has you know very strong opinions so it's just refreshing to see a character like that so. exactly and as a uh very loud and proud bisexual i was so fucking hyped to hear that one joke in the first episode that was like don't straight shame me and i was yes. like yes we got more gays on this I was like did, was that even a conversation to to developing these characters or were they already developed and it was like yes this is just like reflective of the times now I mean they were all the brainchild of Josh Safran the showrunner um, yeah. we all once the room came together of the different writers we did like flesh it out a bit more um but and of course that was always something that was on our minds like to give an authentic uh, mm -hmm. new new viewpoint of, of, of who these characters could be and instead mm -hmm. of tropes like beyond the tropes mm -hmm. of what we've seen and what people have tried in the past and yeah yeah and I love too that again just like Luna Law's character there's no like 
conversation about these people's like gender identities or sexuality or fluidity even it's just it just is it's just played naturally and there doesn't have to be like a moment to point it out it just feels like I live in Los Angeles and West Hollywood so maybe I'm just around it more but it just feels like my life and to see how I've grown from the original semi stereotypical tropey characters into like this person like I even get chills Amos, I'm such a fucking gossip girl whore. Like, it just feels amazing to see how the show grew and took notes and saw like what we could make this show and character be for a lot of people. And like, does that fucking excite you? Like, yeah, it excites me to see it because I mean, to see it after all this time, it feels like it's been a long time because of COVID. There was some, you know, there was uh, a bit of a a lag, but there, Mm. but so it's been, I feel like, um, you know, I'm seeing this for the first time as well with everybody yeah. else. Um, yeah. So it's been really exciting. Like every week, you know, old school, like every week I'm tuning in to like, yeah. the show. So it's, that is so it's old treat. school. This is like the first show in a while. You're so right because of COVID that I'm like putting on my calendar to watch versus ah, I just fucking turn on Netflix and like whatever the fuck is in my face, I guess I'm watching. Are you watching it like at midnight as it drops or are you watching it like the next day? Mama takes sleeping gummies and goes to bed at 930. So she uh, watches on Fridays or like Saturday morning, like yeah. her, my cartoons, but I have to be alone. I put down my phone. I need to like really mm. absorb every line because yo, this shit is quick An ensemble this big. Like, how do you as a writer keep up with that? and write that many people and stories. I mean, it's a collaborative effort, you know, in the writer's room, it's people, you know, pitching stories, um, arcs and character arcs and dialogue, but, you know, then, you know, people are assigned individual uh, scripts and they go away and they write it. And then, you know, then there's rewriting. So it's really uh, such a collaboration that it's, it's, it's a it's good to have many hands on deck for the yeah characters. and I feel like a lot of young writers it's something I had to learn that like to be a writer in television or like streaming whatever you want to call it you you do so much alone to get to a place uh, at the table that like you don't realize this is not supposed to be done alone so by the time you get there you've really done it all written scripts like punched up like created developed and then to be able to get in a room where it's like a little bit of pressure I mean, does it feel, um, is it a relaxing environment? Is it like SNL where everyone's doing coke and staying up till four in the morning getting yelled at? Or like, is it more relaxing? I think there's like been a new, there's been a, like, honestly. It's, I have friends on I'd that say, show, so I know. I fucking I'd know. I mean, this is a drama, you know, it's a soapy teen drama. Um, and so I am at, I don't know what comedy uh, writer's rooms are like, but that's like what we go to. We think of like, you know that the moment in um what's the the comeback you know do you have you watched that with um lisa kudrow playing valerie oh no but i do know what you're talking about people love that show yeah well there's season one where she's like you know she's working on this like kind of like really bad sitcom and she goes into the writer's room to give them cookies in the middle of the night because they're up late rewriting and she's trying to make them like make herself likable and she just walks in on them like anyway it's just watch the season one of of the the i'm going to but basically the, the writer's room I think writers room in general are places where you should let you should push your extra extroverted self out. Mm. You know that's where it's best for. So if you're introverted, it's you have like so I can be introverted often. Yeah, sure. So I you know you have to push yourself to 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 be in on the conversation because it's yeah. there's a lot of voices in the room. I did the Sundance New Voices Lab in 2019, and oh. it was the first time I we got a mock writer's room and I think it was like Danny Chun or someone from the office that um came in and like ran the the fake show we were creating and let me tell you I learned a lot about my motherfucking ego and self in a writer's room like (laughs) getting shut down not having anything feeling kind of useless like doodling on my page like I don't think people know writer's rooms I feel like and correct me what does your writer's room look like with snacks and and toys but I feel like every writer's room has like motherfucking play-doh kinetic sand fidget spinners all kinds of markers like I feel like the room is just like a child's 
a grown up child's playground, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think part of the process is being able to like, you know, sit in your silence and like and zone out and like come up with these moments. So, uh, I mean, we had like magnets that we play with. Uh, um, people yes. were you know, drawing. I love to like sketch draw as well. Yeah. Um, what else did we have? I mean, the, I just remember the magnets and I've tried to find the magnets for myself now that I'm not in the room because I want to yeah. play with them. Oh, and also yeah. like that weird putty stuff. Um, yep. There's that, like, it's like a goopy kind of putty. Um, like uh, Crazy splat. errands. Crazy oh, errands. It's okay. Favorite, yeah. Good to know. So yeah. tell me about the process. Like, were we in New York City? Were we over Zoom during COVID? Like, how did you guys get up to the, like, the, uh, I guess I should say, like, do you create the whole season and then it shoots and airs? Are you guys writing and then shooting? Like, how does the whole process work for scheduling, I guess? For this show, uh, we wrote it in in person in Los Angeles um, before COVID. And it was, um, yeah, we were, so we were in a physical writer's room and it ended like right around when, when things were starting to shut down. But it was like, that was actually just like the timing. And um then the, you know, they started, I'm not sure when they started filming, but, um, you know, obviously they film in New York City. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and so when it was done, because there are a lot of pop culture, like time sensitive jokes that really work in today's time. Like you guys got a lot of COVID jokes in there, conversation and like the pop culture stayed relevant, even if you wrote this in 2019, like how does that work? Well, there's like, you know, updates and punch ups that, you know, when, when time has passed to yeah. make it, you know, to, to get to that point. Okay. then so, we But have I wasn't, I wasn't really like, a you know, once it like ended, mm. then it was, it was really, there was like the waiting game of, of production right. and stuff like that. Right. So, but yeah, rewrites happen. Yeah. We have yeah. to talk about the, the actual dialogue because, oh my God. This shit is so fast. If you like look down at your phone and you missed like the best line and it's so smart. And part of me was like, do you have to know that people that are like this in New York City culture, like to name a brand or a spot or like a, a you know, a meme or something that's popping in New York? Like, do you have to know that culture to be able to get it so right there were people uh, that were that knew very specific New York City culture and mm. history and and what you know and location. So that yeah. was you know major absolutely. Yeah. There were people who were like that you know they knew exactly what they were talking about. Because like to you, I'm like you're so nice. I thought like <laughs> writers would be like like the characters. Like you have to pull from your own personal experience. But like, do you know anybody in your life that is like any of these characters? I feel like I am able to take, you know, my own experience in the world and people of all different ages into these characters, you know, yeah. like when it comes to like writing dialogue. So it's yeah. not, it, it, yeah, I feel like I've lived a life. So. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and these kids are pretty mature. So, right. I was going to ask that because my, my co-host on my, my uh, TV and movie podcast, uh, Zach had said something like, I want these characters to be like messy and drunk and sloppy. Like I, I want them to be a, a fashionable mess because I, that's the world I want to live in. I don't want to live in them being super woke or, or political. Like I want them to be problematic and messy, just like the world looks like kind of in New York city. And I was like, that's, that is true. It, it feels like it has a tone of what we talk about and deal with today but that we can still create that entertainment piece of it. That is like, you just want to watch them be fucking rich and messy, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I didn't grow up that way, but it's so I, I, you know, it's, it's cool to, to, to pretend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You got to put like your pretending head on, but let's talk about you. Like as a writer, what kind of experience did you bring in from your life and your journey into the show? If at all. I mean, Jeez, it, I, I always feel like I have like such a connection to like young adult and like uh, like teen stories, maybe because like as a trans person, like I when I was in high school that I didn't get to experience what I feel would be like a traditional teen right. coming of age. It was sure. very like stunted and like, you know, isolating and it, it mm. was so so I really connect with like, you know, like the the, the crushes and um, the, the wanting to find yourself and connect with like you know, just like the messy moments of not really knowing like how you fit in or how you, um, even like some of the characters on the show who who seems, who are together and, and know who they are. It's just, right. 
they're still kids. Right. And like the actual actors themselves, some of them are a little older than high school. And I think that that was a funny conversation like on social media about the age difference between the teachers and the students. Like the actual actresses may even be older than the actresses playing the teachers, but they're playing high school students. Like, do you look at any of the social media response and want to go like, Hey, as a fucking writer, there's a reason why we do this thing or that thing, or, you know, I don't really know. I don't like look on Twitter or anything. Um, wow. I just am on uh, Instagram. And what it's the just fuck like, <laughs> yeah. cho- what about you made you go, I'm not going to be on Twitter. Um, I used to be on Twitter maybe like 10 years ago, but then, and I, and I was active for a while yeah. and then I was just like, didn't enjoy it <laughs> yeah. what else to say. It wasn't for me. And I felt like putting energy into, mm. for me personally, like into yeah. like trying to come up with something that people would like connect with and want to like yeah. share widely or retweet. I was like, I should just be like focusing on like <laughs> writing a script and like getting a job like that way. Yeah. You're like not trying to write for the fucking SNL weekend update. Like your two liners right. on Twitter aren't being like resurfaced as your job resume. Like you I just, it just felt style. too. Yeah. I just would rather like, I'm more of a like visual, like let's share photos and talk about it yeah. on, on Instagram. <laughs> well, I think that brings up another great point about like aesthetic in this show is so important. Like the fashion, the outfits, the colors, the, sh- the phone, like the way they text, they type it. it the aesthetic is just so like, I want to say Gen Z. I mean, is that something you guys write into the script as you know, people who get to experience that or, or, you know, maybe not in real life, is it still pretending? I mean, tonally like that feel, I feel like I was pleasantly surprised with like seeing it for the first time, like as it aired on HBO max. And I wasn't like wanting to hear like the music in and, you know, Mm -hmm. not just the soundtrack, but like the, um, you know, the instrumental that like really added to the tone of, of every scene. It was like very exciting. And that I wasn't expecting it, you know? Right. Right. I I love it so much. Do you like, are you able to watch a show that you write and not analyze it? Like, do you have to watch it a couple of times? Like one as enjoyment, one as anal- analyzing it. I, I want to rewatch it like multiple times. I haven't yet, but I, I do like, I want to be able to like go back and like make sure I've caught everything. <laughs> but I did, I did worry that I would, you know, maybe have the experience of like, I can't watch it or, you know, I'm, I must <laughs> yeah. remove myself because I felt that way with like, mm other things that I've worked on in the past. But yeah, not sure. Now I just, now I want to like do it. I want to, I want to eat, eat it up it a million times. Well, I wish I could tell you like how well it's being received on Twitter. Like <laughs> I go and just look up the hashtags and see what people are saying about it because it's so funny and people are so digging it and people that are original fans. Like I feel like maybe I'm wrong. You can tell me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the teacher's storyline was kind of put there for people like me who are 30 about to turn 31 that watch the original and have like characters to identify with rather than just high school kids who maybe it feels like too much of an age gap. Am I going too deep? I have no idea. I'm actually not sure because you know, that was all like that was figured out before I joined. Yeah. You know? I feel like that's gotta be a touch of it where it's like, you can see yourself in the teacher position now and like thinking about these kids are just, I feel like an old person on my patio porch going like you crazy kids and your cell phones and your fashion. And just, blah, blah, blah. Wait, who do you identify with most on the new show? Oh my God. Oh, I like probably I want to say, fuck, that's such a question. I mean, <laughs> I am a raging bisexual, like a little problematic, a little bit messy. So I feel like the obvious is what's his nuts. The Chuck Bass lookalike, the twin fucking Max Wolf. Max Wolf. And that's why I can never remember his name because it's Max. And I remember being like, that's such a Chuck Bass name. Like you're never going to forget Max Wolf. But I love like ox fluidity. I love uh, that potentially they're getting into like some sort of open, maybe potentially three summy relationship. I'm in an open relationship with my partner. So I just feel so represented of those feelings of seeing like what, you know, holding maybe a secret or, or a jealousy in about a, a crush to your partner. And then finally the relief that comes with revealing that and then realizing your partner also is down to fuck other people. Like it just feels so now. So yes, I think probably Max And even though, like, I had someone ask me, like, do you feel like it's tropey? Like the bisexual one is, or pansexual one's messy. And I'm like, 
I'm that though. I am that. Like there are bisexual people that are kind of the like dramatic ones. So I don't know. Like, wh- what about you? Tell me, who do you identify with most? Oh goodness. Um, I don't, I'm really like feeling, I love like Aki's story. I was going to say, um, Ak. yeah, yeah. Tell yeah. me more. Tell me more. No, I, I'll just leave it at that. I'll just okay. 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 I'll okay. Just okay but I love it. You know, I, I just, I, I love what I've seen so far. Yeah. Um, like what the world has seen and like, you know, yeah. the questions that are coming up about that and the exactly. conversation. So it, I, that's that. exactly what I said is it's going to spark a lot of conversation. I think in like relationships too, which is something that I don't think we have enough of in our media at all is that kind of, um, polyamorous always I feel like sounds like such a buzzword but yeah open fluid just sharing love I, I I'm excited for that as well but I want to talk about more of you as a creator I know we have to talk about no ordinary man tell us what what is coming beyond gossip girl you're like off and popping man it's been a busy month of like releases <laughs> for me so it's, maybe no it kidding. seems like I'm busier than I am but like <laughs> But we, we love that energy. Yes. We let it Let's happen. Let's just go with it. And yes. like, I'm, I'm super, yeah, but um, No Ordinary Man is a, is a feature documentary about uh, the life of um, a jazz musician from the 1950s-ish era named Billy Tipton, who was uh, assigned female at birth. And uh, after he passed away in 1989, um, he was outed as transgender and his oh, wow. um, adopted kids and his, his, fine, his uh, last wife did not know. Um, so that, so it's really more about a, it's a conversation about Mm. how do we talk about Billy Tipton, um, a man who maybe didn't want his story told at least, especially by, uh, trans creators. Um, so it's, it's co-directed by Chase Joint and Ashling Chin Yi. And I co-wrote it with Ashling Chin Yi and it filmed, it was, um, fully funded by like the Canadian grants and government. Uh, oh this, like, this being a story about a, an American jazz musician. Um, wow, what? So go Canada. Let's, let's go it's Canada. It's totally incredible, right? It's yeah. amazing. And it was it played the festival circuit for about like almost a year. But now Oscilloscope Labs has uh, is distributing it. Yeah. Um, it's in theaters now. It's in theaters um, all like in like, you know, the small, like the art house theaters. Like yes. it's playing in a few places in LA, New York um, and opening all over. But um, I can give you the, the link if you want to share I, it later. Yes, absolutely. And I... I think that like even to have any distribution right now as things are opening back up and like with COVID and and just being able to have that at all out there in the ether is amazing. And like, that's a huge deal for, you know, people that maybe aren't in the entertainment industry to know that like having the distribution on that. I mean, getting yes. that story funded, co write like how do you feel about telling this story? What is that conversation that you're having to prepare a lot for in I'm assuming PR and media interviews? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like it's, it's, it's more about, you know, coming up as a trans man when there was hardly any representation yeah. and then fi- like kicking it back to a personal level, Googling like when I was, you know, like 17 years ago, transgender, or maybe I was asking Jeeves at yeah. the time, you know, <laughs> oh, like, no, you know like famous trans man or FTM, female to male and right. Billy Tipton's name coming up with wow. like very few information, just being like, he cut two records. He had three kids. He was outed after he died, you know, and, uh, you know, died in Spokane, Washington. So like having that moment of being like, oh, cool. Like there's someone who like lived a life that was kind of, uh, you know, he is successful regional jazz yeah. musician, a right. gigging musician at the time. Yeah. Um, and so I, he's really, he was like a, a, a form of a possibility model for me. Right. So it's about, you know, reclaiming this moment of while, yes, maybe he didn't identify, uh, want to be like talked about as an out mm. trans icon mm-hmm. or figure right but what does he mean to people in my generation in the next generation who uh, need people like him you know we right. need, like how we need these stories and it's about just kind of like uh it's it's really a conversation <laughs> no I mean it's 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 a necessary one too I think I mean is his family involved at all in the yeah the doc? His, uh Billy Tipton Jr so his uh, youngest of youngest son is kind of like he was like the emotional heir of Billy's yeah, life yeah. and he had given you know he kept everything of Billy's like his saxophones oh. his music um his pomade um wow so, so he had like you know we did get to talk to him and it's and the, the structure of the film is not as a traditional documentary there are oh. like a lot of like talking heads in terms of like sure. trans uh historians and music and music uh musicologists and yeah. people who know trans history and his story wow. and then Billy Tipton Jr. is one of the people we interview but then we have an element of like uh, casting 
where we mm. bring in like all trans masculine actors to audition for the role of Billy Tipton. And in between those auditions, it's conversations about, you know, did they know his story? Did they not? So it's, wow. it, it brings it to a community. Um, you know, it's a community conversation. No kidding. And what did you find like to be the answer of, of, I mean, this is the first I'm hearing about this person and like, holy shit, why? <laughs> yeah, I found like the younger generation to not uh, like kids who were maybe like, you know, in their late teens, early 20s, didn't weren't really aware of who he yeah. was or had just heard about him when they got the audition. For right. this. Um, the people who are like, you know, 30s and older trans guys had heard of him. Um, and, you know, it's all like there's some moments in there where it's a, it's a big part of the conversation is like the talk show circuit and the exploiting yeah. of Billy's family in 1989. Uh, so you'll, you'll see that there's Oprah makes a cameo um, ah! because his family did the talk show circuit right. and, and they were, they asked very unwell questions at the time right, and right. really tried to get them to spin a narrative out of, right. of, of Billy being a deceiver um, instead right. of being a, a man who lived a stealth trans life. Right. Um, or a stealth life or just lived his life period right. if we're not using right. the language. So um, right. that's a part of it. Oh Another my God. Thing. Sometimes, you know, Billy's story, because it, 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 I link it to the Brandon Tina story sometimes sure. and the way that the, the media treated Brandon right. Tina the same way. And how, do you feel at all that there has been a change in the media and how we tell, you know, either real life or scripted trans stories? I think, yeah, of course. I think that there's definitely this, comparing it to 1989. Like yeah. now, if you're going to misgender or like try and spin a narrative of oh, hell of no. trans deception um, on a talk show or, you know, mm. then it's, I mean, it's not, you're not going to get away people with it. People will come for you dragged. on Twitter. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's, <laughs> but I think that people have a, big, a bigger responsibility now as journalists, as storytellers, mm. um, mm-hmm. trans or cis, that, you know, they're aware of like the stakes. Um, right. Finally. I mean, this is a huge project that like, I, I imagine you, you know, like you have to prepare these answers. You have to know the project intimately, but like, also I feel a little bit like you are also that icon paving the way for people that like, you're just living your fucking life authentically and massively successful. Like, do you feel that at all with what you're doing in this space? I feel like I, I mean, as as a, someone who has always been like an artist from a, you know, from a sure. small kid, you know, into like a photography as a young adult and to mm. now like writing, it feels like the way that I connect with like my transness is, is to, you know, talk, talk about it through storytelling, through visual art. And, right. and that's, I, I guess be, that is in one way, like leaving something behind or for something for people to see. Oh, um, yeah. But that's really nice of you to say. I mean, it, it, just, is. it, it, feel, it, it sometimes it's like uh, it feels uh, a bit heavier than I than I mm. wish. But it's just something. Sure. That, you know, well, I think the territory as it becomes more and more visible, and even just you know, being on an iconic show like Gossip Girl and stuff, like it just feels again like the universe taking us in the right direction and honoring that. And ke- like, I don't know if you believe any of that like spiritual witchy shit, but I do think like everything happens exactly as it's supposed to happen and what do you see hopefully for yourself in the future because to me you met you done you made it like I don't know what else you want because I'd just be like I retire now <laughs> I'd love to keep working you know unscripted television dramas and comedies um I want yeah. to do both I'd love to you know eventually be a showrunner one day create Ooh, my own show the hardest so, like, job of all I, of course, when I completely like, you know, lose every hair that I have left. Yeah, right, um, right. I think that it's, that it's been such a fun collaborative experience for me. And I, so I'm really loving this after working mm. in like, you know, more of like an unscripted and, and documentary right. and like, and as a photographer and even back when I was a background artist, you know, yeah. like, this, you got like, it all. writing in the writer's room is that's, um, I feel very uh, content and inspired. Yeah. And like, I, I really appreciate your multi hyphenate um, career because I'm someone going through something so, sort of similar. I'm, I'm currently on a, a creator of a, a doc that is a, a feature doc with, with um, LeBron James's company about mental health with a, a story about a young girl who wrongfully imprisoned is still in the judicial system. She's supposed to be out any day now. That's a whole nother episode, nice. but like to be doing that 
and then being known as like a YouTuber, but then also like l- working with Lauren, uh, our, our mutual friend on a scripted show. Like sometimes I feel that I'm worried the industry is going to be like, you can't do this because you've been doing this thing. Do you find any sort of like pigeonholes or type casting for a- as a writer that you you have had to deal with or? Well, not yet in terms of being a writer, but when I was trying to make the jump from like unscripted as like I was a producer on like Mm. Gaycation for on Mm -hmm. Viceland and then I was working on a bunch of other like shows that were nothing like Gaycation but as like a producer in that in that world where I wanted to cross over so badly to scripted but it was um it was you know so separated that I knew that I had to start from you know the very beginning which meant you know being a PA and uh them training me as a script coordinator Mm. in as a you know in my thirties. Like right. that was working the way to, up. Yeah. And I, it was something that I was like, okay, this isn't, so my, me being a producer in this world is not going to translate. Right. Or, you know, it was just like the way that I was able to, you know, that's just how I played it because right. it also was good. I learned a lot doing yeah. these support roles and um, mm-hmm. it, it meant a lot to be able to just even be in a writer's room at that time um, right. uh, in, in the supportive role. I mean, to me, it's so, so fun and full circle that you were in an episode of the original gossip girl. And now you're like that, if anything, just shows exactly what we're fucking talking about that. Like you can do it all. The universe, but just, the you universe. know, the full circle universe. I will post those pictures one day, maybe before my episode oh, airs. Please. Oh my right. God, please. Did you make it? Are you in any of the new gossip girl episodes? Did you go oh, on no. set or anything? No, no, I didn't Oh my go God, you didn't try and poke your little head in. I would be like, hey, no. dress me in something I, fantastic. No, because I'm, I'm in LA and I haven't, you know, right. COVID, it's, things are really, right. you know, fair. locked down. It's not as easy to, uh, for me to just visit. But, fair, fair, you know, fair. Hopefully in the future. Ma- season two, it. I'm putting it out there. There's no fucking way they ain't making a season two, baby. That shit was the most watched for me on HBO Max. We know that to be true. That's an accolade to add. I mean, I feel excited that I've I've met you in like your your explosion here. Like I can only see it going up for you. And you know, I I appreciate again you taking the time to talk about this and like really want you to know how big of a deal you are and what you're doing. And I I only see positive things going up from here but before i shower you and and plug and blah 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 i want to play a little game with you before we go because okay you know i i just have to get a little gossip girl on here so i've named this uh uh, game xoxo or no so your answer is either going to be xoxo as a yes or just no so i'm gonna ask you a few questions and of course if there's anything you can't reveal just feel free to be like, no, I'm not going to tell you that. Okay. Do you agree XOXO or no, that OB definitely has Dan Humphrey's hair? XOXO. Yes. Like a hundred percent. I'm like, are you kidding me? They are. Okay. Um, is Audrey somehow related to Blair? Cause come on, they are motherfucking twins. Do you have no, no clue? I have no <laughs> idea. Okay, because holy shit, when I saw that, I was like, oh my God, they're going to make this Blair's daughter or something. And then I saw her mom, Kiki, and I was like, oh, okay, never mind. I was trying to figure out how Kiki could be like a nickname for Blair Waldorf and I never found it because it's not real. Okay. <clears throat> XOXO or no, Zoya is as innocent as Jenny Humphreys was. That sounds like a trick question. <laughs> yeah, because Jenny went fucking. <laughs> all the way and... Yeah, trick question. Okay, no, then we we passed that one. We passed the one. Okay. Uh, TikTok will be making an appearance somehow in the social media. XOXO or no? <laughs> I actually don't know. Okay, because listen, I love the way you guys portrayed social media in the show, but I'm like, where is TikTok? Yeah, TikTok is, I love just scrolling TikTok. I don't create Same. on there, but I'm just looking at it all day. Same. I have a severe, I mean, the, this audience knows I've had so many fucking TikTok people on this podcast. I just, I, it, it's part of my life. I, I hope to see them making some TikTok dances. That would make me very happy. That would be really okay. Fun. And my last question, XOXO or no, space Coke is a real thing? XOXO. <laughs> <laughs> that one I can answer. Oh my God. When I saw that, I was like, is that so space coke for anyone who hasn't seen episode three is um cocaine with a dash of ketamine listen 
I go out in West Hollywood. I have never heard of Space Coke. I mean, I think it might be going by a different name now. That I, I, I wow. or actually, no, wait. I, I think I don't know how often that term is used nowadays. Okay, is a term that I remember. Yeah. Uh, okay. Fair enough. Because I'm like, I want to go to wherever was, that club is. That was good. That was. Good. <laughs> Yeah, that that's the game. That XO, was memorable. XO, no, it was very memorable. Um, Amos, thank you again so much for doing this. Will you please tell our confidants and listeners where they can find more of you and your project? Of course. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Amos Mac, A-M-O-S-M-A-C. Um, my website's amosmac.com for info on screenings of No Ordinary Man. And I'll yes. also give you the link. Maybe you can paste it for like the direct ticket link. Or Yes, uh, 100% will be below. Yeah. And you know where to find Gossip Girl on HBO Max. Duh. Not HBO Max. If you don't have HBO Max, <laughs> what are you doing? Get rid of that Netflix. You don't need that Amazon Prime. HBO Max is where it's at. <laughs> um, Amos, thank you so much. And thank confidants, you. we will see you next week. XOXO. XO.